Good morning. Welcome to the City of Columbus Veterans Day Ceremony. My name is Rick Isbell. I will be your Master of Ceremonies. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome the Ohio Department of Corrections Honor Guard. Please stand. I would now like to ask Councilmember Craig to come up and give the prayer. Dear Heavenly God, we do thank you. We give you praise for allowing us to get up this morning. God, on this auspicious occasion, this sacred occasion, as we honor our veterans, those who have paid the ultimate price that we would have freedom. God, we recognize that freedom is not free. And so, God, we pray not only for them, but the families that they represent. God, we ask right now that you would keep us in your loving care. That you would ever be mindful of those that are suffering around the world. Those that are without food and without clothing. That we're always mindful. We're always careful to give you the praise. Now God bless these families. Bless these young people that are here. Let them always never forget. Upon which this country has stood. And that is freedom and and for all around this world, and certainly for those that are in our nation. Now, God, all these things we ask in your name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir. On the bottom. Thank you. And now, for our national anthem, Mr. Udo Morosher. And please feel free to sing along if you uh, if you wish. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er oh, the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled 
yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, Udo. And now it's my pleasure to bring for the Pledge of Allegiance Terry Brown, Franklin County Recorder. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, recorder. Please take your seat. Wait, sorry, don't take your seats yet. Honor Guard. Order. Now you can take your seats. Please put your hands together for our Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections Honor Guard. One of the most outstanding examples of what a color guard should be. So once again, thank you for coming. It is, uh, it is my pleasure to be here and be your host and to thank all of our, our representatives and senators and um, VIPs, our military members. Would all of our military members please stand? Let's put your hands together for our military members. Thank you for your service. As you well know, this event is largely put on as a labor of love by a local veterans group called the Mill Vets. It's in cooperation with the city, the VA, and many other entities that have put blood, sweat, and tears to make this happen. A few people make a lot happen. We are truly blessed to have many active, outstanding people who really care about the veterans and military people they serve. And with that, I would like to call the mayor of the city of Columbus for a few words. Thank you, Rick, and uh, it is a pleasure to be here once again and uh, to see all our military come together in celebration of our veterans uh, in our community, all who have served, also those who serve them as well. Today we talk about paying for it. There's a young man, eight years old. His name is Miles Eckhart. He found a $20 bill in the parking lot of the local Cracker Barrel. And he was going to spend it on a video game. But he changed his mind when he saw this guy in a uniform. And he looked at him and he said, because he was a soldier, and soldiers remind me of my dad, I changed my mind. And so, with his dad in mind, Miles wrapped the $20 bill in a note that read, Dear Soldier, my dad was a soldier too. He's in heaven now. I found this $20 in the parking lot when we got here. We like to pay it forward in my family, so it's your lucky day. Thank you for your service. Signed, Miles Eckert, a gold star kid. So that's why we've chosen 
Miles Eckert and Lieutenant Colonel Frank Daly as our honorary Grand Marshals in today's uh, parade. They'll be out there today. Our men and women in uniform that have served our nation so well will parade through the streets of Columbus. And we will stand and honor them and show our respect for them because they have kept our nation free and our city free. We love them dearly. And we celebrate those who give back as well. Today you will hear about the 100-year anniversary of World War I. And we'll see a patriot and former captain of the USS Constitution, Lieutenant Commander Owen Huff, bestow upon the city of Columbus his ceremonial Navy sword, and we'll be glad to receive it. Our mission is to honor and serve all who serve today, and we want to thank the families, the communities uh, that have helped make this happen. Mill Vets, in particular, so much for all you've done over the years. We've become great friends over those years. And I see these two little kids over here. Have them stand up over here. They're the cutest kids. Come up here. This is what it's all about. We celebrate our veterans to make sure that you all, turn around, let me see you. You all grow up to serve our country and to become great adults, but they're starting out right, aren't they, today? They're here at this event, and uh, they're dressed in celebration and in honor of our veterans. Thank you very much. Okay. So, let's get them, bring them back over here. I'm going to give you a proclamation. Come on up here. I'm going to give you a proclamation. This pro come on, Rick, you can come over here, too. They're taking the show. You can stand next to them. They're, they're cuter than I am. Yes, they are, a lot cuter than you are. They're taking the show. I want to give you this proclamation of Veterans Day observance on this day, November 7th, issued by the mayor of the city of Columbus. God bless you, God bless America, and God bless Columbus. Here, let's give this to you. <laughs> it's great when you can give them back, right, Mayor? <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you so much, Mayor, for your, your great words and, uh, and for these great kids. <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. We have some, uh, we have some representatives. Uh, Richard Spicer from Congressman T. Berry's office is here today. Michael Dustman from Senator Portman's office and the great senator from our 15th district, Sherlita Tavares. Thank you for coming today. And um, here in a minute, I'm going to introduce our next state house representative from District 26, Herschel Craig, to say a few words. Herschel? You know, I'm always very humbled by this moment, always very humbled. I think of Harry Bass in 1966, and we were in the 11th grade together at Columbus East High School. Harry uh, dropped out of school and enlisted in the Marine Corps and was killed six months later. As a great grandfather, I'm always reminded how fleeting life is. I've looked at those children, and they're really our future. In fact, they're 100% of our future. I think about all the men and women, all the servicemen and women, uh, with families, with children, with great-grandchildren ch great that left and will never come back. But I'm also reminded they will always be in our memory of people that we love and 
Even people that we don't know were fighting for us. So that we could get up in the morning, we could be here at Columbus City Council, uh, we could be all over this country, we could have religious freedom, all of those things are reminders of how important it is for those that pay the ultimate sacrifice and those that are currently serving uh, our military forces so that we, all of us, could have the opportunity for freedom. So on behalf of Columbus City Council, all of my colleagues, certainly the mayor of the city of Columbus, the Senator Tavares, uh, certainly our recorder, and all of you that is here, we thank God for you. We thank God for you being here, and certainly we thank God for your service. God bless you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that very much. I would also be remiss if I didn't recognize that our city attorney is here, Richard Pfeiffer. He is a Army veteran. Thank you for your service, sir. And we also have, thank you, go ahead. Good to go. I also have a great contingent here from Ohio National Guard. Our commander in chief, General Ashen Hurst, is here, and she's brought her staff with her. With her, would you all please stand? Thank you very much. And uh, we also have uh, Colonel Sherry Bosley from DSCC, right here. Thank you. We also have very, many fine representatives from our veterans groups. We see American Legion here, I see VFW and a few others. So thank you all for coming today. Now, I would like to I would like to um, say it's been a pleasure working with um, Mott's Military Museum. I'm a board member, and I see firsthand how they reach out to our youth and teach them. And they teach our community about the great things that have happened here and abroad. So today we celebrate veterans. 100 years ago, a terrible war raged across the world. It was called the war to end all wars, and there is no one more qualified than our next speaker to give us some insight on World War I. Our keynote speaker is Mr. Mike Parilla, who represents Mott's Military Museum. Mike? Thank you, Rick, Mr. Mayor, members of our governing bodies here in Elsewhere, General Ashen, first a Ronald Reagan salute to you. And my fellow veterans, past, present, and future. My name is Mike Perilla. I'm a card-carrying member of the greatest generation. This means that I endured the Great Depression, where the unemployment rate was an unambiguous 25%. And while still a teenager, I raised my right hand to enlist in the Army Air Corps as an aviation cadet. However, today I want to talk about my dad's war. My dad was a private at the 4th Infantry Division, saw combat in three major campaigns. I want to talk about World War I for several reasons. First of all, 100 years ago, Many, many citizens of all countries were being slaughtered in a most brutal war. Next, the aftermath of World War I created events which still impact upon our lives today and on history. And lastly, many of the traditions and customs by which we honor veterans and our war dead on both Memorial Day and Veterans Day had their genesis back in World War I and the years following. So let's take a look at World War I and its beginnings. 
At the turn of the 20th century, Germany was on the march. She was arming aggressively and had designs on her neighbor's territories. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, in the words of that famous 20th century philosopher, Lawrence Barra, also known as Yogi, it's deja vu all over again. <laughs> now, Germany's actions resulted in the formation of the Triple Alliance. It was a grouping of England, France, and Russia to protect themselves. Now, we know that in human affairs and in science, for every action, there's always an opposite and equal reaction. And so it was that Russia, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire formed their own alliance. It was called the Great Powers Alliance. All in all, this created a very volatile stew in Europe. It looks like everybody was itching for a fight. And it needed only a catalyst to set things off, and that came in, la in the latter part of June in 1914, when the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Archduke Ferdinand and his wife were assassinated by a 19-year-old Serb. What happened next was a chain reaction. All hell broke loose. The assassination of the Austrian, uh, Austrian heir to the throne uh, caused their army to immediately enter Serbia. Now, Russia retaliated by mobilizing its army to protect its friends in Serbia. Germany then mobilized to protect Austria, and Britain and France finally mobilized to protect Russia. It was inevitable, therefore, that the guns of August began to roar, signaling the beginning of World War I. <clears throat> Britain declared war finally on August the 4th, of 1914, uh, when Germany invaded Belgium. It caused their defense minister, Edward Gray, to say, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Well, that sounds a little bit of hyperbole, but it really expressed the mood of pessimism which pervaded Europe at that time. Now, World War I carried various labels. It was referred to as make the world safer democracy. <laughs> that sure worked, didn't it? Historians uh, also talk about the war to end all wars. And they agree today that World War I simply sowed the seeds for the beginning of World War II. Its aftermath certainly and subsequent events uh, saw the rise of communism, Nazism, and fascism with all of their attendant evils. World War I simply became known as the Great War. Now, I don't know if anybody realizes it, but World War I was also a war between first cousins. King George V of England, excuse me, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany and Tsar Nicholas of Russia were all blood relatives. They were all first cousins. Uh, they were all worried in war against each other. And in their earlier years, they all called Queen Victoria anti. But World War I was not a simple family feud. It was a very nasty, brutal war. And all wars are nasty, and certainly World War I had its own platter of nastiness. Hostilities eventually were, <coughs> excuse me, hostilities were eventually uh, related to, uh, resulted, I'm sorry, to a stalemate with both armies hunkered down in parallel trenches eight feet deep that ran some 400 miles from the North Sea to almost the Swiss border. Everyone called it the Western Front. And it was fought by generals schooled in obsolete strategies that dated back some 50 years and even back to the Napoleonic era. Now, the strategies were certainly good for Napoleon, but they were not applicable to the, the, the times of World War I. A typical result of these strategies occurred at a small town outside the Franco-Belgian border called Poshendale. Now, within 90 days, 
450,000 soldiers on both sides were killed. And at the same time, less than 10 miles of real estate exchanged hands. Now to put that in context, that 450,000 number, in all of World War II, in four years, in all services, are killed in action, numbered slightly over 400,000. However, there was another factor which was contributing to this carnage. This was the age of rapid technological growth. This was for the first time World War I saw the advent of aerial warfare, fighter planes chasing each other across the sky. And there was a German dirigible fleet that bombed London 50 times, making civilians combat participants. The British introduced tanks for the first time. The machine gun reached its peak deadly efficiency during this period, and flamethrowers also appeared. And horror of horrors, German chemists developed chemical warfare in the form of chlorine and mustard gas. Unrestricted submarine warfare was largely the reason, carried on by the Germans, uh, was largely the reason which precipitated U.S. entry into World War II in mid-1917. World War I was also the first war to be run on oil. And that was due to the rapid development of the internal combustion engine at that time. Now, horses were still around, and there was a French general that said, for every soldier, I need six horses to support them. Well, six horses, of course, present a real logistical problem. They eat a heck of a lot more than one soldier does, although I think I've met some guys that came close. Uh, and, and, of course, six horses presented a very serious solid weight disposable problem. So it was a collision. The confluence of these obsolete strategies and the evolving technologies that produce these high rates of casualties during World War I. Now eventually an armistice was negotiated early in November, but there was a high-placed individual who insisted that fighting continue and cease only on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Of course, this resulted in more needless casualties on both sides. Now, participating in this cauldron of death was a young Canadian medical guy by the name of Colonel John McRae. He had been a surgeon before the war, and he was posted along the Franco-Belgian area in a place called Flanders. It was spring while he was there, and the blood-soaked earth we saw nature beginning its inexorable cycle of rebirth. And from that earth there sprang a profusion of wildflowers, indigenous to that part of the world. Now, Colonel McRae was a very spiritual man, deeply moved to see this juxtaposition of life and death taking place before his very eyes within the horrors of war. Before he too was killed, he penned his famous elegy to honor his fallen comrades. Now his work is short, it's very short, it's only 97 words. I actually counted them. Before I recite his prayer, however, I want to suggest that there are several lessons which reside between his lines. His work reminds us that freedom comes to us from a higher authority, not from man. It also warns us that maintaining, excuse me, maintaining freedom carries a very, very high price tag. And it also tells us that today we are on a very secular slippery slope, which is taking us away from the Judeo-Christian underpinnings which formed our nation's birth and our very existence today. 20 years ago, Ronald Reagan said this, if we ever forget that we are a nation under God, then we will become a nation gone under. Now, I've painted a pretty grim and sober picture of World War I, but, uh, and it really was 
a very sober and grim times to, to be around. However, the human spirit is, is very powerful, can prevail even in the worst of times. And so this era actually had an actually a very much lighter side. It created a, a, re, a, a it created a very substantial library of popular music. And some of those songs I think you know today. It's a grand old flag, it's a high flying flag. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. It's a long way to Tipperary. These are all songs that we sing today, and we, I used to sing marching. And, of course, in World War I, there was that mournful plea penned by a famous uh, army private. His name was Isidore Berlin. He was the son of Russian Jewish immigrants. We know him as Irving Berlin. And he penned his famous song, Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. And the last verse is really, really something. He said, someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday I'm going to find him dead. And then I'll get the other pup, the guy who wakes the bugler up and spend the rest of my life in bed. Now those of us who have endured combat always fall back on prayer and the black humor, not unlike that voice by Irving Berlin. And we do this in order to survive the nice edge that separates life and death in war. However, though it is almost 100 years since World War I, the words of Colonel McRae are deeply engraved in our commemoration of both Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Now, many of you know Colonel McRae's words. You've probably learned it in school, just as I did. But if you've forgotten it and have never learned it, it goes like this. Listen carefully. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row that mark our place. And yet in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing fly scarce, heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we loved, we lived. Held dawn, saw sunset go. Loved and were loved. But now we lie in Flanders fields. You, all of you, take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Amen and amen. Thank you and may God continue to bless our United States. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, please give a right round of applause. <laughs> and now, I would like to uh, call Senator Tavares to make a very special presentation. Senator? Thank you very much. Um, to Rick Isbell, certainly to our mayor. Um, thank you for opening the um, chambers of city council to this ceremony. It's really important that we honor all of our military uh, men and women and for those who have si sacrificed so much for all of us. Uh, to our adjutant general, she is doing such a wonderful job. Thank you so very much uh, for your representation on behalf of the state of Ohio. Um, to my colleagues who are elected and appointed officials, and most importantly, uh, to the military men and women who are here today, those who have lost their loved ones uh, to a conflict, to a war, to an incident uh, here in these United States or abroad, and to all of the family that's here today. I am honored to be here 
for this special recognition of Lieutenant Commander Owen Huff uh, as he makes a special presentation to the City of Columbus. I'm here as a part of the leadership team of the Ohio Senate, uh, but I'm also representing the Ohio House today because both chambers wanted to recognize this honor being given to the City of Columbus. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Owen Huff uh, was the commander of the USS Constitution. And for those of us who know a little bit about history, uh, it was commissioned back in 1797. Uh, a long, proud history of Old Ironsides, which it was named back in, I think it was 1812. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Owen Huff uh, had the opportunity to command that ship. And what I understand is that recently uh, it took its last commission on October the 17th, I believe it was, uh, and now it's going to go for restoration. Mayor, we are proud that uh, you have cameras here in the chambers because the speech that was just given gave all of us a history lesson. And it will be here forever because we have captured it. And we are happy, Lieutenant Commander, that we are going to capture today's recognition of you and your service to our community. So if you, and I believe it's your great, great grandchildren would come forward, um, Sophia and Benjamin, I'm going to present you with these two one is from the Ohio Senate, and one is from the Ohio House. And I'm not going to read them, but it really recognizes your great-great-grandfather, Benjamin. I'm going to give you the one from the Ohio Senate, and it's signed by me and the President of the Senate, Keith Faber. And then I'm going to give you, Sophia, the one from the Ohio House of Representatives, and it is signed by Speaker Batchelder. Representative Kevin Boyce and Representative Michael Stenziano. Congratulations and thank you so very much, sir, for your service and for giving us these wonderful grandchildren, uh, great-great-grandchildren, to, to be a part of today's ceremony and to be a part of today's history. Congratulations. Why don't you go ahead and stay up here, ma'am. Senator, Mayor. I'd also like to, to bring John Sturba, who is the commander of uh, the Columbus NOSC. Come on up here. Uh, we have a very special presentation. Sir, would you like to come up, say a few words, and then present your sword to the city of Columbus? You can come to this side if you'd let's like. Let's come to this side. Let's come around this way. Sir, let's come all the way around. Just to make one correction at this point, I'm Commander Owen W. Huff's son-in-law. Okay. Fortunately, I married his daughter, and I have this honor here tonight. Senator Tavers, members of the state legislature, um, Mayor Coleman, City Councilor Craig, Ohio veterans, and distinguished guests. On behalf of my late wife, Corporal Ginny Cavanaugh, proud World War II <coughs> member of the Army Reserve Corps of Engineers, uh, yeah, as well as the entire Cavanaugh family, we are delighted to present Lieutenant Commander Huff's ceremonial sword to the city of his birth. Ohio is home to many heroes of foreign wars, and my father-in-law distinguished himself in combat off the coast of Italy, earning the Legion of Merit. He, his exemplary service was further recognized by our nation when he was named captain of the historic USS Constitution after World War II. In addition to his sword, 
My great-granddaughter, Sophie Brown, has presented a replica of old Ironsides, and great-grandson Benjamin Brown carries documentation of Commander Huff's service records for inclusion in your new Veterans Memorial, currently under construction. My son, Dr. John Kavanaugh, and my lovely daughter-in-law, Lily, Executive Director of the Ohio Latino Affairs Commission, are proud citizens of Columbus. Both strive to follow the public service record of their great-grandfather. We named my son John after John Fitzgerald Kennedy. So let me close with a quote for one of our most beloved presidents. We in this country, in this generation, are by destiny rather than choice, the watchmen of the walls of the world of freedom. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of our power and responsibility, that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, and that we may achieve in our time and for all time the ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our cause always underline our strength. For as it was written a long time ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Thank you very much. Now it is time to bestow upon the city of Columbus the support of the USS Old Ironside. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look at that. That's history, ladies and gentlemen. History. Very nice. Let's lay that right there. I like that. And now, without further ado, I would like to call Pete Zeretic, MilVet's Scholarship Chair, to announce the winners of the 2014 MilVet's Honorary Scholarship. Pete? Thanks, Rick. Senator, Congressman, Mayor, City Councilman, Judge Advocate, uh, General, and your staff, and distinguished guests, active duty, retired, and former military, uh,
Happy Veterans Day. My name is Pete Zaretic and I represent Mill Vets. And today, as you may or may not know, we sponsor the parade. In the theme of paying forward, we would like to represent a community that comes together following our services to then educate our future generations about the experiences that we had, whether they're positive or negative, but that spirit. So today I'd like to present three scholarship awards to individuals here in Columbus who represent that spirit. If I could have up front Sarah Speller, Tamara Carter, and Stevie Yoakum, please. You'll turn around and face the group. The criteria for the Mill Vet Scholarship for Veterans Day is a dependent or a grandchild of a former military person in the central Ohio area. And these three representatives met that criteria, along with grade point averages, participation in school, and most compelling is an essay on why they are seeking higher education. Why do they want the money from Mill Vets to seek higher education? And these three representatives stood out from the applicants and have won. So on behalf of Mill Vets here in Central Ohio, I would like to present the scholarship to Stevie Yoakum, Tamara Carter, and Sarah Speller for this year's winners for the Veterans Day Scholarship for Mill Vets. Now I would ask that you will all rise and give a moment of silence for those in harm's way and our brothers and sisters who are no longer with us. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Lieutenant Robert Ronan, bagpiper for the ODRC Honor Guard. And this will close our festivities. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. We will now depart for the parade. There is transportation waiting on Front Street for those who need to get to the start of the parade. For those who will be in the reviewing stand, it is right outside the front doors to your right on Broad Street. The parade steps off at 12 noon. Thank you for coming. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, I think you it was a little rough. You're such a great job. Thank you.